today we have a provocative title, who's more functional, uh, Groovy, Kotlin, Scala, or Java. And uh, I have a disclaimer. So I'm not actually doing any language comparison. I'm trying to uh, tell you something about what functional programming is, how, how we can benefit from it, and how it's supported in modern languages and what we want. Okay, uh, a few words about me. Uh, I work on Project Kotlin at JetBrains. Uh, so it's another new functional, uh, not really functional, <laughs> language for, um, for JVM. So it's supposed to be like a modern language for industry that will let all of us be more productive uh, with our existing environment. And I also serve as an uh, expert group member uh, working on Project Lambda, so uh, I'm guilty of uh, having a hand in Lambdas for Java 8. Okay, so I'll try not to be too biased towards Scotland, uh, but of course I'll present my language uh, and tell you a lot about other languages as well. So, a prologue. Imagine your uh, five-year-old son, Jimmy, coming up to you and asking, Dad or Mom, is Java a functional language? Well, I don't know what you answer, but I would be really surprised and say, don't you know your dad from your mom? <laughs> well, if you think about this question seriously, it's a good one. I mean, to answer it, you at least need to know what is Java and what is functional language. So, well, I assume you know what is Java, so I'll try to tell you something about what a functional language is and wh what uh, functional programming is like. Okay, so let's go back to 1936. No computers around, and uh, this is the time when functional programming was actually conceived. So it was definitely not for programming any computers. It wasn't called functional programming then. It was called Lambda Calculus. It was created by a mathematician, Alonzo Church, who worked on some mathematical problems of uh, mathematical problems of decidability of higher order logic or, it, or first lo first order logic actually, and uh, he came up with this very interesting, very neat way of uh, writing down algorithms. Basically, only ten years later, the first production computer um, was was available, and it was totally not functional in its architecture. It used von Neumann architecture, which means that you have a huge piece of state, your memory, and you mutate it with commands. So your, um, your program is a sequence, sequence of commands, and every command may, mut may mutate any place in your memory. Uh, then Fortran came about 10 years later, and <clears throat> it was again uh, structured after this von Neumann architecture, where you, uh, you're supposed to write out statements, and every statement is that command that may mutate the uh, global memory. <coughs> Fortran was um, developed by a team of engineers led by uh, John Backus. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit behind my slides there. So Fortran came in 1956. It was developed by a team of engineers led by John Backus. Uh, well, in 20 years from that time, uh, tell us something very interesting. But first, two words about Fortran. This is the probably the most interesting language on earth today because it's the most long-lived one. It was developed in 1956 and it is used widely up to now. So it's, it's one of the first languages and it's still around. Isn't it cool? So John Beckes um, received his Turing Award in 1976 and in his Turing lecture asked an interesting question. Can programming be liberated from the von Neumann style. And von Neumann style is this idea of having one huge piece of memory mutated by, uh, by a sequence of commands. <clears throat> and of course he was meaning this functional programming, which was not around at that time. So there were no widely known functional languages and almost no functional languages at all. So func functional programming at that time was existing only on paper. And since that time, the research started about real functional programming on computers, 
And uh, since that time, we have these two uh, ideas of phenomenon architecture and functional programming converging uh, to meet and uh, really integrate with each other. Go ahead. Uh, what about Lisp? Lisp. Uh, uh, there actually were a few functional languages already, yeah, but uh, you're right about Lisp. Lisp has something to do, even the early Lisp had something to do with uh, functional programming, but let me skip on this. I mean, it, it would be too many details to tell. So, another question from your son. What is good about functional programming? Any ideas? Go ahead. Uh, it's good for parallel programming. Any more ideas? Okay, so it's immutable state, functions without side effects, so on and so forth. Uh, okay. Well, we're told that it is good for, uh, for our complexity, yeah, for uh, our parallel programs. Uh, what I would say is that it makes you look smart. <laughs> Almost like wearing glasses. <laughs> but there definitely is something to uh, the idea of using functional programming concepts uh, for managing your, uh, your compl complexity and for making your uh, parallel programming easier. Uh, let's have a look. So if you compare this phenomenon style and functional style, <coughs> one is, again, mutating the common state, and uh, you cannot really take your program apart and just take a piece of code, look at it, and see, okay, this is doing this particular thing, and nothing else may interfere. Since you're mutating the same uh, piece of memory with many other commands and pieces of code, even if you're not parallel, you can't be sure that nothing is changed while you're making some procedure call or something. As opposed to this, uh, in functional programming, the, the main concept behind the, uh, the initial idea was that you take your inputs, you never rewrite anything, you just produce new values reading the old ones, and in the end, uh, you give out a result. So there is absolutely no mutation of anything, and your programs are compositional. So nothing has any side effects, and if you take any piece of, of code, nothing can possibly interfere. So you can analyze things piece by piece, and mathematicians like this so much, because they uh, tend to uh, work with complex pro uh, problems, not like us. Right? Our prog problems are easy com compared to mathematical ones. So they knew in 1936 that they needed something really pure to be analyzable, to be reasonable, <coughs> in the sense that you can reason about it. And so this is like a clean concept that brings some order into our lives. And with this order, we can manage our complexity. This is why functional programming is good for, say, parallel or multi threaded programming because it's just too complex without it. We have to abstract to, <coughs> to do all this. And the technical nature of this order is, yes, being immutable. Nothing has side effects, nothing mutates anything. So if you have a state of the world, it will never be altered, it will be only appended, added to. Okay, let's have a look at what price this comes at. <clears throat> I have a sequence of numbers for you. One, one, two, three, five, so on and so forth. Uh, what is that? It's written there. It's Fibonacci numbers. So <coughs> uh, Fibonacci numbers is just a prominent example for, uh, you know, for a school task. So here is a function written in Kotlin. Can you read the code? Okay. So here is the first piece of Kotlin many of you ever encountered. Uh, so I'm introducing the syntax. Here is the function declaration. I have a Fibonacci function of one argument n returning an int. And the body says this is kind of a switch statement. When n is 0 or 1, it returns 1. Otherwise, it returns the sum of two previous Fibonacci numbers. So it makes two recursive calls. OK. 
So this looks pretty much like a mathematical formula, more or less. Uh, so it's probably the most important thing uh, you have to have to be functional, right? You need recursion because this is how you define functions in general. So, and this test is passed by all our candidates. Everybody has recursion, obviously. Now, what's very bad about this function? What? It never ends. Why? Uh, well, some recursive functions do actually terminate. Stack overflow may be a problem, but not really. Yeah, it's horribly slow. That's correct. It's so slow you can't imagine that. So if you didn't know about it, please don't write your Fibonacci production code this way. Uh, so let's have a look why it's so terribly slow. Here is um, a call tree. If I want to compute a Fibonacci of five, I have to compute it for three and four, and for four, for two and three again, and for three, two again, and one. So every Fibonacci number gets computed many, many times in the course of execution of this function. So it gets exponentially slow. And this is actually the, the price we pay for this uh, very simple definition here. So you, it seems like you either have a clean code or good performance. It's not really like that, but it may be like this sometimes. <clears throat> so a very functional definition of this is very slow on phenomenon architecture. Of course, if you have some great other machine, it will be very fast. Or if you can do very clever optimizations targeted primarily for functional techniques, you can also have better performance here, but generally it will be slow anyway. Okay, let's compare this one to a classical imperative, very bad looking code. <clears throat> so here is my, another implementation of the same Fibonacci function, Fibonacci imperative, still one argument, two variables here, and a loop. So if you think about it, uh, every next number is just a sum of the previous two, right? So what I need is to store those two numbers and as I compute the next one, just to throw out the, uh, the trailing one and shift the pair, right? So the third one is one plus one, next one is one plus two, and I only need those one and two and don't need the, the first one. So that's what I'm doing here. Here's my pair and I compute the sum and then replace the pair, basically shift it one position to the right. And this code is terribly imperative. It mutates the state all the time and has a loop instead of recursion. So it's very non-functional, but it's fast. It consumes a constant amount of memory as opposed to the previous one that takes linear memory on the stack. But you will never run into stack overflow because it will run forever before it gets to any stack overflow. <coughs> and it will be linear in the end, which is good. Any questions? Okay. So now let's see about how effect free we can actually be in real life. So again, I have a question from your son. Dad, how do I print hello without side effects? Well, you think about it, you have your functional, like purely functional program. No side effects, no mutation. Uh, you take your inputs, you produce your outputs, you're not allowed to affect anything around you. How do you print anything? Well, I can, just to get rid of the boy, you know, I can say, okay, let's make a deal. Whatever you give as an output, I will print. So your program actually produces your console output and will be printed. Okay, then, how do I write to a file? Well, I can write the same thing to a file. Again, your outputs, like, go to a file. But then, how do I do both? I want to print something and write something to a file. Well, in contemporary functional programming, this is the point where monads came in and other very interesting stuff. <coughs> but in the, on the conceptual level, th this is just not possible. So the idea of not having any side effects contradicts any altering of the outer world. Network communication, writing to, to the file system, reading anything from the file system, printing to the console is not possible. 
So being really purely functional, having no side effects whatsoever, is a test that's failed by all four of our languages. We actually can mutate the state. We, <coughs> we do not enforce any mutability on anything, any purity on anything. So we are not purely functional anyway. Makes sense? Any questions here? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, is there an analogy with uh, storing our state in a database and mutating it there? Basically, yes, of course, because you have your, again, your mutating state. There are those appending databases that don't mutate anything, but it's a different story, like not in a SQL database. Go ahead. Yeah, let me repeat your comment. So, yeah, I'm being a little bit unfair here uh, because if you think about a functional language which is usable in any way, it definitely can write to a file or print anything, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, this is being approached by either monads that isolate mutability or by having a little bit of mutability on the side like ML has. But, <coughs> uh, but our languages don't have even this. So we cannot in any way control the mutability um, in our compilers. All we, all we can say is, okay, you can be voluntarily immutable. If you write an immutable class, it will be immutable. Thank you very much for your comment. Okay, so I'm finished with my introduction and there are a few points to take away. Functional programming makes things simpler by abstracting many things away, uh, by getting rid of interactions. Sometimes it comes at a price. And our languages are definitely not ideally purely functional or even practically purely functional. Any questions? Okay. So now we'll talk about the higher order that functional programming brings to us. Uh, here is a test I wrote for my Fibonacci function. It's a silly one, but still. Uh, so I'm just asserting that for every input, my Fibonacci uh, gives the right output. It's fine, but I showed you two implementations of Fibonacci, right? And I want to test both of, of them on the same data. How do I do it? Do it? I can copy the code and ju just change the name of the function there. Or I could do something like this. <coughs> I could say, okay, I have a function that takes another function as an argument and applies it to uh, those inputs here and checks the results. So here what I say is my parameter has a type that is a function from int to, an, uh, to int, right? So it takes an int and gives an int out. <clears throat> so this is the story of famous, whatever, lambda expressions uh, or closures or anonymous functions. <clears throat> but the proper name would be a higher order functions. When you can pass a piece of code, basically, uh, as an argument to this kind of function. So this is definitely something very important for uh, functional programming. <clears throat> because uh, in the very pure, pure sense, all you have there is functions, variables, and function applications, nothing else. So if you want to do something like this in Kotlin, here's the function definition and here are the two usages. So I have my test Fibonacci uh, and I'm passing an argument here which is a lambda expression or an anonymous function uh, or a closure if you want. Um, <clears throat> so what it says here, I'm creating in place a function which takes one parameter n and returns Fibonacci of n. And here is just a little bit of syntax sugar where you can say, uh, that there is already a pair of parentheses, so I don't need this extra one. Any questions? Okay, so this is the concept of uh, a higher order function. And in maybe a year from now or so, uh, all the languages I'm presenting on will have this. 
thank you, the Java team. And Java 8, we're going to have lambdas. That's great. So we're all higher order in this sense, and we're, we all have recursion. Now, isn't that a little bit familiar? Like, as my grandfather told me, in 1995, they used to have this book, Gang of Four, that, that was talking about patterns. And there was this very interesting pattern called strategy that everybody uses all over the place. And even other patterns in this book use this pattern. Like, if you think about what a command is, it's a special kind of strategy. What an observer is, you're submitting those reaction strategies to, uh, to an observable object. What's an abstract, fa abstract factory, it's a strategy for creating objects, and s even state is changeable strategy, and visitor is a strategy for implementing a polymorphic function. So we're all full of strategies, like all our Java programs are full of them. So since very long ago, even in C++, this old book was for C++, <clears throat> we knew this idea of higher order functions. So it's not like a groundbreaking thing, actually. And actually, you all know uh, anonymous inner classes that si simulate those nicely <coughs> rendered uh, uh, anonymous functions in the code. So all we get with uh, uh, Java 8 or any other language with, that supports it is just a decent way of expressing this idea in the code. <coughs> and by the way, the immutable pattern was also in this book. So it's not like we're discovering this wonder, wonderful world of functional programming for ourselves. We're just making things easier to type into the system. <clears throat> Any questions? Thank you. Um, now, a bit on practical aspects of this. So with higher order functions, for example, when you transition to Java 8 or when you switch from Java to Kotlin or to Scala or to Groovy, you get something like this. Uh, this is a collection of users, and I call a for each function to iterate over those users and send everyone a message like hello from your admins. Why, not, why am I not using a for loop here? What's the huge difference between this, uh, which is called internal iteration because the collection handles the iteration by itself, and a for loop, which is external iteration because the collection gives you an iterator and you uh, call methods on that iterator. The huge difference is that you can implement this differently for uh, different collections, uh, and it may be, say, sequential or parallel without changing the uh, mindset of the client. So for normal array list, it will be user one, say hello, user two, say hello, in, in a sequence. But if you have a parallel collection of any sort, you can say, okay, this thread or this machine will be doing this set of users, the other, the other set of users, so on and so forth. We can do that in parallel because this is a function that abstracts your control over and lets you put this thing into the library. And this is, I think, a huge point in uh, modern programming languages, being able to put something like this into the library. Because uh, this is uh, where the most nasty boilerplate comes from. You repeat the same pattern over and over again in your code, not because you're lazy or stupid, but because you cannot just abstract it over and put it into the library. And this is the point of uh, having those modern languages. They help you do this. Any questions? Okay. So the summary of this part would be that I was talking about those very familiar callbacks or strategies, which are very important abstraction that lets you put your control into the library. Now I have a question for you. What is ADT? What data type? Abstract data type. Any other ideas? Algebraic data type. Oh, thank you. So we have options here. And I'll just give you an example. So uh, here is my server and a client, and they will exchange messages. Uh, a client can ask the server, search for whatever word, lambda. 
and server will send messages back saying, uh, I found an exact match at this position or a similarity at that position. So if you define what those messages can be, you can write something like this. This is not Kotlin or any other language. This is just some notation. Uh, so I, I say that my message may be either search for and then a term, or exact and then an item, or similar and then another item. Make sense? So this kind of definition is the ideology behind an algebraic type. And this ADT stands for two things and maybe even mixed up in some contexts. It's either an abstract data type, which is uh, saying that, okay, I have a type and I have these operations on the type, but I don't tell you how I implement them and I can switch that somehow without letting you know. So this is more or less like an interface and it may be in this algebraic type, which is basically a data class. Uh, if I have my abstract class for message, then I can have my subclasses for this message, that message, and that message, and they will only hold data and don't do anything. Make sense? So this is also a very, um, at least very traditional concept in functional programming. So normally functional languages uh, rely on algebraic data and use uh, abstract data types for abstractions over data. So if you want modules there, for example, <coughs> or good libraries, what you do is you say, okay, I'll have type X, I'll later define what it is here, and I have those functions, I'm not telling you what they are. So types there don't actually uh, own uh, the functions, but it's still the same idea as an interface. And then when you specify what the type is, it will be algebraic. So you will just say what the cases are. And we have a close analogy uh, in object-oriented programming, and all of us, of course, have the same thing. Now, here is what it looks like in Kotlin. It will be very much the same in Scala and very close and groovy as well. Uh, but imagine what this is in Java, by the way. Uh, so I have an abstract class called message and three cases, search for term, exact match at location, similarity at location, they all extend message. So here is my emulation of an algebraic data type in object-oriented programming. This is what Kotlin does, what Scala does. <clears throat> and then I want to process a response from my server. So here is a bit of uh, asynchronous programming. So I say, server, I'm sending you a message, search for this word. And also, I'm giving you a callback. This function here, you remember, this is an anonymous function, right? Uh, I'm giving you a callback that you should call when uh, I receive a message from you, basically. So this is not like the re remote server, server itself, but it's the representation of the server on my client side. And inside this function, I say, okay, I, I received a message M, and if it is exact match, I just print that I found something at this position, and if it's a similarity, I say that something is similar at that position. Otherwise, it's an unknown message. Make sense? So this is, if you know about pattern matching, this is close to pattern matching. Not really pattern matching because the patterns are trivial here, but <coughs> for very many applications, this is about as, as much pattern matching as you need, unless you write compilers. So I need a lot of pattern matching, really, every day, and I don't have it. I'm sad, but it's my problem. <laughs> uh, so here, uh, this is basically just a sequence of if, uh, if this is instance of that statement. Uh, one interesting thing is that you don't have to cast. Like in Java you would say, if um, instance of exact match, then come up with a new name, uh, cast, and then use that name. Here you don't have to do that. Just because the compiler is smart enough. But this is about the whole thing. Questions? Is it obvious? Nobody cares, all right. <laughs> uh, okay, so now there is one question. So I'm mostly done with the like functional story, like how functional is your language. It's about as functional as you want to make it because it supports all the tools there and if you want to make it side effect free or immutable in your program you can, otherwise you just don't use this capability. 
<coughs> so the real functionalness in your language is in your head. <coughs> and now, of course, you can be like formally equally functional, but you won't be e equally usable, right? So um, what makes one language more suitable for this or that kind of programming than some other language? Let's talk about what Java 8 brings you and whether Java 8 will kill, say, Kotlin or Scala or any other language. So Java 8 brings you higher order functions. Isn't it cool? So finally, when I have a collection of something, I will be able to say filter me that collection or uh, sort with a predicate or something like that and without having to create anonymous inner classes, so on and so forth. This is great. But how many higher order functions do you get, get for your collections? Well, maybe 20, maybe 100. Oracle people are not mean. I mean, they, they will give you all those interesting functions, but they can't put all of them into the collection interface. <clears throat> and this may be a problem because uh, if you want some other function, you have to again go collection utils dot whatever of collection and uh, a lambda. And this has a problem to it. So you uh, look at this. What I want to say is I have a collection. I want to take those elements that are greater than five and make squares of everyone. Okay? But, uh, and this is how I write it with static functions in Java. I say map of filter of collection of uh, the filter and predicate and then pass the map function that squares every number. Make sense? Okay, now what I have here is reading backwards. I say map of filter of collection. But what I actually want to say, I have a collection, please filter it with this and map with this. So I'm have, I have to jump with my eyes from here to here. And this is unpleasant, isn't it? So this is, I think this is a rather important difference we get in Java 8 compared to what we have in Kotlin, for example. So compared to this, collection.filter of predicate map this squaring function. This has the right order. Here's my collection, filter it and map it. So you can express function composition in the right way. When, when you write the composition operator in mathematics, you may wonder why it's backwards there, but it's actually not backwards. It's the way it should work. What else is good about it? Yeah, it's, thank you very much, it's composable. So you can say, okay, uh, what does filter return? It may return, say, a lazy collection that is then lazily pr processed by the map and you don't have to evaluate everything if you don't need all the, all the values there. <clears throat> so this is possible here as well, but here it's much easily expressible. If you want, say, an iterator from a filter, you can just take it here and you will see the sequence of the functions. <coughs> Another thing is that if you're using an ID, and of course you're using an ID, it's so good for programming, right? You're exploring your APIs with hidden control space, right? You say, okay, here is my dot. I hit control space to see what functions do I have in my collection. And, you know, it doesn't give you those here because it can't figure out what's applicable here. And with this, it would be. So there is a huge move in all the modern languages, except for Java 8, uh, to have this, to be able to add your methods to your classes. And then, of course, there are options, like how you do that. Do you think you can, like, add a method to the string class, for example? I have my string on the class path from the JDK and I want like the last character or last word function on that string. Can I do that? Not really because string is protected by the JVM. JVM depends upon the string so much it won't let anyone touch it. Even with aspects, even with any hackery. Right? So <coughs> if I want to do that, I have to play a trick of some sort. Uh, and different languages do it differently. For example, Groovy will use, um, 
say, an expand meta class or some other dynamic mechanism to extend this, or Scala will wrap uh, the collection object here uh, to create something that actually has that method, or Kotlin will do something else. We just do the code transformation that basically transforms this kind of call, call into this without you seeing that. So <clears throat> I think our way is the least intrusive and the least overhead, but still, it's just different approaches to the same problem. Any questions? Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, how do you compare the two, basically, if I, if I got you right? Yeah, so this is the way you write it in Java, basically. Yeah, you in Java 8, you can't express it the other way around. Because uh, all, you, all you have on your collection interface is the members of that interface. Of course, the members will have uh, map and filter there, but if I have my own map 1 and filter 1, that won't work. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Okay, so let's have a look at how you implement extension functions, uh, which are, which is what we call these extension functions, because you don't actually touch touch the class, but you add functions to it. You extend the existing interface with those extension functions. Um, let's have a look at how you implement them. Go ahead. Yeah, the question is, can I have uh, my laziness in this case or in this case and what it depends upon? Uh, so basically, technically you can do it both ways, but the, the question is how you read it. Uh, because uh, you can, of course, produce a lazy collection out of here and feed it into the map and it will stack one upon another. Uh, but if you say want an iterator, the iterator will be somewhere in the middle of this expression. Uh, when here it will be in the right place. Like you, you know that you operate on an iterator which is lazy uh, right after this filter function. Make sense? Okay. Um, okay, so if you want to extend your class, whatever class it is, so here I'm extending, just to get rid of most of the generics, I'm extending a collection of ints, not a general collection. Uh, so here's my filter for a collection of ints. I say that I have a receiver type in here. So this collection of int is a receiver type. Uh, this is the type we are extending. Now I say filter of whatever function uh, that takes an int and returns a boolean, and I spit out the list of ints. Then the implementation is straightforward. You just create a list and iterate over this, and this is, of course, the receiver that I get here on the left of the dot. And then if your f accepts uh, the item from the list, you just add it to the resultant list and that's it. Make sense? Okay. So, in this straightforward way, you can uh, have lots of useful operations on your existing collections. And what Kotlin actually does, it takes Java collections as they are, without altering anything there, and just adds all the useful stuff on those collections. <clears throat> so you don't have this problem of uh, having to convert all the data or adapt all the collections to uh, pass data back and forth between Kotlin and Java. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's a great question. So I have a little bit of time. You're pretty shy on questions, so uh, my space for questions is not filled yet. So thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> the question is, does Kotlin use those ugly mutable collections from Java? Like, really? Can you think about it? Well, the answer is yes and no. We use the same collection classes. So we're 100% interoperable with Java, but, but we play a trick there. So if you look at what Kotlin's collection hierarchy looks like, you have read-only collection interfaces, like a list is read-only in Kotlin, so you don't have set there, you don't have clear there, and it's covariant. And you have all of those, like iterable, collection, list, set, map, they're all read-only. And then you have 
interfaces derived from those, like mutable list, mutable collection, mutable set, so on and so forth, and your normal Java util array list is seen as if it extended the mutable list interface. So we have split the Java collections. It's all the fictionable, I mean, it's all in the imagination of the Kotlin compiler. So we, we didn't alter any of the JDK. But we view JDK as if it was properly designed for immutable collections or read only interfaces. So <coughs> you can have your own implementations of those read only collections. You can use the existing implementations of mutable collections, and it all interoperates properly uh, and all lives together. Make sense? <coughs> Go ahead. A great question. So the question is, okay, you have those read-only interfaces, but doesn't, doesn't it give you the false, expression, uh, false impression of this being immutable when it's actually uh, mutable by somebody else? You just don't hold a mutable reference onto it. Uh, it's a fair point. There are two answers here. So I think <coughs> there the, uh, the design of, uh, say, Guava is very good, where you have uh, <coughs> basically things saying immutable list explicitly. So this class is not mutable. <clears throat> so I think when, when we finish Kotlin's library, there will be those read-only interfaces, mutable implementations, and immutable implementations. Immutable implementation just uh, guarantees you that nothing mutates. And if you want something really immutable, if you want to pass it uh, back and forth between threads, for example, you want an immutable class, not just a read-only one. But uh, the read-only thing gives you another very important advantage. Because uh, assume you want to print a list. So I'm, I'm writing a print function that takes a list of any objects and prints them out. So how do you write that in Java? You say, I take a list of question mark extends object, right? Or just question mark. This is something about coin contravariance because otherwise Java won't take you, your list of strings where a list of objects is expected. Right? And if you have those immutable, or the, sorry, those read only interfaces, they're already covariant in Kotlin. So you can pass a, a read only list of strings where a read only list of objects is expected. So this is the dream of like, everybody. Can we have that already? Like, I want just a list of something. Can I say a list of any? Yes, you can. Make sense? Good. Go ahead. Yeah, the question is, <clears throat> since we know about what's, what's immutable and what's not, uh, can we optimize anything uh, to help JVM optimize at runtime? Uh, the answer is I don't know. So it will definitely depend on how you write those implementations for immutable collections, and I haven't looked into it yet. So I suspect that it won't be much more efficient than what Guava can do for you. Yeah, because it's no, no hints in the bytecode, it's just the implementation, that's it. Go ahead. Yes, so our, uh, th th there can be different approaches to making things lazy, but <coughs> our approach would be to say that you operate on an iterator rather than a list, and uh, you produce another iterator as a result. So it will be a lazy operation uh, which takes an iterator to an iterator. This is how we distinguish between lazy and eager computation in Kotlin. Okay. So the summary of this part is you can extend existing types and that's very important because you want your own libraries. You want to be able to read the text from the file after all, even if JDK doesn't provide you that function. And you want that without changing the classes. So I'm coming to the ending, and it will be the last question. Dad, should I use functional programming? What is your problem? 
And this is the very important question, if you think about it. Because uh, any technique comes at a price. So if you want to be super optimal in one core, you'd better not use any functional things, because the super optimal thing will, will be a von Neumann thing, mutating everything, consuming as little memory as possible using loops and everything. If you want a large scale application that should scale up, you probably want abstractions that will give you an opportunity to uh, change the underlying implementation so that you, be, you are able to scale. <coughs> and if you're parallel, you want to guard for all the problems you know about or don't know about just to eliminate them altogether. Right? So you, I'm not giving you a recipe. You have to use functional programming for your problem. It depends on your problem. And <coughs> the same applies to any language. Like, people would come and say, okay, should I switch to Kotlin? Switch to Kotlin from C? Don't know. Maybe not. Uh, and your benefit depend depends on what you, on what your problem domain is. If you are like, if you're trying to write the shortest piece of code that makes the work done, you're probably better for Scala than for Kotlin because Scala is all power possible. If you want something that will be compatible with and understandable by everybody in the world. You want Java. If you want something written very fast, but working, you don't care how slow, you probably want Groovy. Uh, if you want something for a large scale code base, understandable by many people, but still very performant and modern, you probably want Kotlin. So a postscript to my talk is Kotlin is cool. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, go ahead and ask them. Uh, go ahead. Uh, excuse me, there, there is someone behind you. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So um, there is another definition to what a higher order function is. This, is. this has nothing to do with mathematical definition of a higher order function. But in Lisp, for example, you would be able to introspect your code and change what's there. But uh, I think this is too extreme <laughs> for, for any practical, well, for, for much of practical programming. Uh, there was another question. What about JavaScript? Okay, we we do compile to JavaScript. Uh, so if you uh, if you want your Kotlin to work um, uh, in the browser and on the on the server, you can do that. Uh, so you can have the back end written in Kotlin for Java and um, the front end written in Kotlin for JavaScript. It's in the works, but we're already compiling. More questions. Uh, the question is, what about frameworks like Play? Um, they're great. We haven't started any real work on integrating with them, but there is a plan to integrate with, particularly with Play. Okay, thank you everybody. I have some Kotlin magnets here on the table. Grab some if you like. Thank you.